Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Precious Musings on Studio 60, uh, where we celebrate some groundbreaking, revolutionary sketch comedy week in and week out. We're just so in awe of this show that uh, we feel the need to get together and talk about it every single week. Um, with me today uh, is Matthew Smith. Matt? Hello, Robert. It's a pleasure to be here once again to discuss one of the finest 90 minutes of television that I've seen ever. And Megan McKay. Uh, hi. Okay, well that that might be a little problematic later on. It sounds like Megan is not fully on board of this episode. But Matt, can you agree with me that this was this was a fantastic episode of Studio Sixty? E each week I watch this show and I wonder how how can they surpass what they did the week before? It's just such trenchant satire on a level uh, that. Uh, that when the Greeks were writing their their epics, it's the sort of thing that they that evolved directly from like the works of Plato or Socrates. Well, I mean, I mean, the Greeks didn't have Massey Oka back as a ten-time host, and you know what? I think that they would appreciate it if they had gotten that chance because what a tour de force Massey Oka brought to this episode. I mean, I, I, anybody want to pitch in here? I just. I, I'm, a, I'm astounded by his range and versatility. I mean, it was, uh, it was okay. I, I, uh, I hmm. sort of, like, popped into the episode, like, halfway through. Um, <laughs> but he seemed, like, he seemed like he was holding his own, I guess. I don't know. Uh, uh, were you saying that the star power of Masioka was not enough for you to tune in at 1130 sharp? I just, like, um, I don't know. I forgot it was on. Uh, and then, uh, you know... Wow. So I'm I'm just wondering. I I mean I, I don't know what you're gonna have to talk about around the water cooler tomorrow morning, but uh, it, it's I mean that was you missed a great episode, and so we'll we can try and catch you up on some of the sketches you might have missed. I don't know if you saw them online. Or... I saw I saw most of it. Like I I did come in halfway through, and I think that's when the good stuff happens is after midnight. Well, it's all good stuff. It's all it's all good stuff. Yeah, we'll catch you up on the good stuff. Okay. okay. All right, so, I mean, first of all, we have to talk about the cold open. The cold open, uh, pitch perfect, Stephen Sondheim parody, Into the Woods, now turned into a commentary on Ted Cruz's announcement of going into the political race for 2016 president, Into the Race. I mean, that was just like a, a, a stroke of brilliance that I did not expect. I don't know if America expected it, and I I'm, I'm think we're all better for having seen it. Uh, yeah, a lesser show, um, so one that I won't name, would have used, probably sunk to the levels of using popular music, um, would have, uh, you know, with each punchline that comes along with it, given it some room to breathe and let the audience chance to soak it in and laugh at it, instead of just piling other jokes on top of each other, and... Right, uh, I mean, like, this is timeless, this is timeless, Sondheim is timeless music. Absolutely. It, it, so, uh, like, uh, Matt Albee is not falling into the trap of, of just making a, a, a show that ties into the present moment or just tries to be relevant. I, I, I think that, like, it, it's really to the show's credit that it keeps, despite some of the naysayers, uh, Megan, um, that yeah. it goes after uh, something that will be recognizable 50 years from now, 100 years from now when everyone looks back and, and looks at Studio 60 as one of the crowning achievements of comedy. See, that's the interesting thing, because I think if my kids were to look back on uh, Studio 60, especially the musical stuff, they'd be like, oh, this is uh, this was on TV once. Um, it's kind of strange. I mean, I guess it makes sense, because they leave, like, you know, 20, 30-second laugh break pauses <laughs> that, like, sort of get full, but, like, not Really, like, I feel like that would just, it just confuses people a little are, bit, you know? Are, like, are, it's just, it's just silly. It's, it's just, is it a joke? Like, is it supposed been, to be a joke? Or? I mean, are you, are you not standing up? I mean, I know you didn't see the first half of the episode, so good for you. But, I mean, you, you weren't standing up and, and applauding in your home. I, I think that those, those uh, pauses that they, that they left in there were perfectly timed. As, as a, a great writer like Matt Albee and a great uh, producer like Danny Tripp, they know how to play that audience. They know when to pause and when to let the audience respond the and way when, that they should. And when they find a laugh line, making sure to repeat it five times because it gets each fun funnier each time more so than the last. Exactly, yeah. I mean, that's just comedy 101. And, and Rule of fives. Rule of fives. 
as for your kids, like, are you going to raise them to not know the works of Stephen Sondheim? I, 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 I'm dumbfounded. Well, I guess, I mean, whatever. I guess you're right. I, I, like I said, I wasn't there. I was, um, uh, I was washing my hair, so I missed a bit of the show, but, uh, you were washing your hair for 30, I, 30 to 45 minutes? Yeah, I, mean, I work all week. I need a break, you know? Um, Studio 60 is your break. Studio 60 lets us just take a step back and laugh at the world around us and really, I mean, for me, brings a lot of comfort. It sounds like okay. corporate advertisers have gotten to you and telling you that shampoo is necessary to have in your life at any given moment, and you're sacrificing, you're using commercialism and consumerism instead of this fine art that has been put in front of us. Okay. Um, do we want to move on to the next sketch? Uh, Matt, maybe you and I can come back to it on a later episode. Yes, please we'll don't. Address this later. Please don't stop. Go, just go for it. I don't. It doesn't. Okay. Le, yeah, you're right. Let's just move on. Let's okay. So, on. so I mean, we can move on to the Masioka monologue, which was just a brilliant, brilliant, uh, uh, inspiring speech about how um, uh, television is really. Uh, what binds us together. Everyone has a television in their home. El everyone watches Studio 60 live every week. I mean, it's just one example. Uh, so we, we can really feel unified, even though uh, politicians might try to divide us. And, and so I really... Uh, it not only was funny, it not only was uh, uh, a great, great uh, satire uh, in its own way of uh, how, politi how politics might divide us, but... Um, also, that it was a great explanation for why he decided to, to join the Heroes reboot uh, and come back to that role that made him famous. Um, Te yeah. tele television has the power to unify us in a way that other mediums cannot. As a, it has the ability to uh, put cast a mirror back to us as a society so we can see what we look like through this twisted looking glass. Uh, I, partic I particularly uh, was inspired by his mind. Like, it brings a tear to me. It made me feel like I was walking through the halls of Studio 60 myself uh, so, uh, to see uh, the history, to take pictures off the walls to keep for myself, to uh, just soak in the legends that had walked through those halls. The, it, it brought me to tears. I, I wept. Uh, I, I openly wept. Okay, but okay. So I, I was on. Did, was it really eighteen minutes long? Because it was. It was. It was, it was eighteen. The network like let it. them run long. You like it. The network let the episode run long, and I think we're all the better for it. Yeah. Mm. When you have a ten timer like Masioka, I mean, you give him the time he needs. You you cater to his demands, and you let him do him. I mean, that's just what you got to do. I don't know. I sure. I, why not? You know, I, I just I, I personally think that 18 minutes is maybe um, a little bit long, especially mm -hmm. for a monologue. But uh, if it worked, then great. Uh, how long would you have made that monologue, Megan? Like I would have probably. I mean, I just can't. I don't want to offend either of you, but I have a real difficulty thinking that Masioka has much to say. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, but all right, we'll 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 let you go on, but uh, okay. okay. I probably would have right. said three... My blood, my blood pressure is rising, maybe. Yeah. Three and a half minutes. Wow, that... But then you don't you don't get into the Bay of Pigs. You the don't get into the Cold War. You don't get into how television brought us through this history together. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a reason it's cold. It's It's not happening anymore. It was excellent. <sighs> it was such a great. It was expertly directed by a, lo a long-time director, Cal Sharpley. It was. Uh, I don't. I, I, I don't know. Three and like a half maybe, minutes. The length of the history, pop song. Come on. Maybe history doesn't matter to you, Megan. I mean. It's not. Uh, history matters. Like I. History matters. You're so blasé about the Cold War. Saying, uh, uh, funny joke. Funny joke. Oh, it's cold because it's it's a, it's a dead topic. Like it's like it shouldn't even be taught in schools. Is basically what I heard you say. So. Yeah, um, I can't well, agree with that. I can't go along with that. I'm sorry. I mean, I'm not saying it, it, like it, sure in school, but it's it. The Berlin Wall fell like 30 years ago. Is that right? 30, 31 years ago. <laughs> you don't know. Okay. <sighs> okay. Um. Great. Well, maybe, maybe we'll find some sketches that are more up to your speed. Like yeah. Megan, Megan, what what was one of your favorite sketches? If you want to talk about it. I mean. It, 
it's it's always I mean it's always a little bit slim pickings for me, but I think if I had to pick um okay. I really like Peripheral Vision Man. I thought oh, you know, it's kind of fun. God. It's kind of silly, you know. Uh, it's 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 just a goofy little 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 sketch, little joke. It's kind of fun. It made me giggle. It was the first time I laughed for probably until that happened in the episode. I was sort of stony faced. You could see the um, embarrassment on the faces of everybody in that sketch. The the bone that they threw to Rick and Ron after their show got canceled after six episodes, as we all knew it would, and they let them come back to the show for. God knows what reasons. Pity. Largely pity. And put out that sketch maybe once or twice a year. I mean, it's, it's crazy enough that it's been going on for for years now, like over a decade, but I mean, uh, when, uh, I mean, when the, when some, when they gave it to Keenan Thompson, who came over from SNL to Studio 60, um, and took over that sketch, and just, I mean, he made it so loud, and he made it so like it's just it's it's just like even if I were to say that like Peripheral Vision Man uh, deserves some respect uh, at this point it's just kind of treading water over and over again. It's the thirty eighth time by my count that they've done Peripheral Vision Man, and I don't think that it's improving in any way. It's fun. I think it's you know it's a romp. It's a family style romp. I like that. <sighs> it After was funny a long once. week of work. I wouldn't I, go that far, Matt. I wouldn't go. I wouldn't go once. Maybe I half. Would, time. I would say. I would say it was funny the one time when uh, Adrian Brody hosted, mm -hmm. and he did, uh, he, he performed okay, it as a reggae character for, and it was clear that he was sort of just mock mocking the very sketch that he was in. See, um, I found that I kind of racist, but uh, this funny, is but... Oscar winner Adrian Brody. So... I mean, is it racist if it's off script and unplanned? Because then it's not like they didn't intend any racism behind it. So you kind of have to like, if it's made up in the moment. Well, well, I, mean, I, someone, I, well, someone... I mean, I mean, okay, he was in blackface. Uh, like, if you technically, technically, I'll give you that. Fine. Okay. Does someone, does someone literally have to wink at the camera for you to understand it's a wink at the camera? <laughs> I mean, it was. I, I don't know what you want me to say. Like he was, he had, he was doing. You know, he, he painted his face black and was doing an accent. I don't know what you want me to say. It, that for me is is racism. Well, uh, <laughs> this might well, be a debate we have to do at a different time. Well, what yeah. is or isn't racism? But okay, we'll, we'll we'll discuss that one again when we see it in the best of special because that's what it was. But that wasn't this week anyway. Neither here nor there. A I mean, man, I mean, in, in purple, purple, Go ahead, go ahead, Matt. Go ahead, because I'm just so I can't deal yeah. with this. Yeah, 180 degree, your field of vision. Ah, and that that was a TV. Oh, I don't know. And they I say it. How I, they I, say I, it? They I, say 180 degrees of vision, uh, every 10 seconds, almost on the dot. Just 180 degrees of vision. 180 degrees of vision. How did you find me, peripheral vision man? I have 180 degrees of vision. It's not a punchline, Megan. And so much narration involved. If they just gave him a sidekick and give him someone to talk to, they wouldn't have to use so much exposition in that way. But. I don't. I uh, look. I, I clearly, I'm not going to convince you guys that blackface is racist and uh, that this sketch is funny. So, I guess we can just move on. <sighs> okay. Okay. Um, now, uh, what what did you guys think of News 60 this week? Um, I, I know we didn't talk much about it before the show, but I thought that uh, uh, Simon Styles. Uh, continuing his his uh, amazing run as one of the first black anchors of uh, a fake comedy news show, um, so I'm not racist, Megan. Um, I I think that uh, Simon Simon has, is really he came into his own in 2006, but now he's kind of coming into his own again, if mm -hmm. that makes sense. Like I, I know exactly what you mean. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like it. It like. Uh, when he stopped uh, in the mill after uh, that joke about uh, the, uh, the 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 fraternity rant, uh, the fraternity racist chant, um, and which we'll get into in that later sketch. But uh, yeah. uh, when when he brought that up, and then he it turned into a ten minute, very moving monologue about how he came from the streets, and he brought himself up. 
uh, he bootstrapped himself from the streets to become a Yale drama student. Um, that, that to me, if there hadn't been so many other uh, best of moments in this episode, that would have been one of the best of moments of this episode, I think. It was, it was, it was inspiring. Uh, I myself may try and re-enroll and go through the Yale system myself because, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, ha, ha, to get to where he is, to get to behind that new 60 desk and deliver those punchlines with just such, you know, monotone conviction. And most others would try and hack, a, 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 you know, play a character with it or emphasize a punchline, whereas mm -hmm. this... They just go with an even keel, let the jokes speak for themselves. And they're not afraid to like to, to like make the audience turn on them. Like and and to a degree that the audience never does because they just recognize the conviction. But yeah. like um um I mean I hate to bring up the Daily Show with uh Jon Stewart, but um uh who's luckily on his way out, but he like he just kinda like tells the audience what they want to hear. If that makes exactly. sense. Exactly. Studio 60 tells people what they need to hear. Mm. Mm. Yes. That's... So, did Matt Albee write those words? Because that is that is exactly how one should summarize my, that. My understanding is Matt Albee writes all the words that are worth saying. Megan, you're being very quiet. Is there is there anything you want to say here? Oh, okay. We might have lost Megan. I thought... Oh, she might have quit out of anger. I don't know. Maybe we'll get her back. Maybe she'll Maybe she'll come back. I don't know. Um, yeah, Matt, do you want to move on to... Uh, I mean, now we can just kind of talk amongst ourselves about yes. how much we loved it, but uh, uh, maybe some science schmines. Yeah, science schmines. Uh, again, uh, another in their excellent line of game show parodies. Um, the, the expert delivery of Tom Jeter as the host. And I believe this time we had the Pope. We had uh, a Bible school student. Uh, and just discussions about... Uh, I, I forget some of the punchlines, but... I mean, I, I think I was probably doubled over and laughed from the first one that I didn't get to hear a lot of it. But, you know, just telling Christians and other religions that what they believe in is silly and just trying to get that message across as much as possible. Okay. Um, oh, look, Megan. Okay, so Megan, uh, Megan decided to rejoin us after yeah. uh, quitting it in anger, I guess, yeah. about uh, not not being uh, in the majority. For I, once. If cr Christians would believe she just came back from the dead. I uh, I just wanted to get a pop, so. But I I. Need some I, corporate sponsorship for them. Do you want you to know, tell us what the what product the product placement? is? Yeah. No, because I literally just went to get a pop. I'm not a corporate shill or whatever you guys are trying to make me, but I mm -hmm. do you want me to talk about the show? I mean, it's, I feel like that's why you asked me on uh, um, here. Well, I mean, it is the original reason why I asked you on, but I, 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 I'll be honest, I'm kind of regretting it, but sure. Uh, we, we moved on. We've moved on to Science Schmines. Uh, right. Again, a great takedown of the religious right. Um, uh, they do this sketch every week now, uh, and I think that's just because the audience has demanded it. Um, because uh, uh, organized the, religions still exist, and they need to be told that they shouldn't. I mean, the amount that that religion has invaded politics and has mm -hmm. started uh, uh, kind of like encroaching on our beliefs. I mean, this week Indiana passed a law that said that uh, gay people. Uh, have to die. Like, that's not a thing that should be allowed, I, I don't think, in my view. Um, so my problem with Science Schmines is that it's a cat it is a catchphrase sketch. Like, we were talking earlier about, like, Peripheral Vision Man being a catchphrase sketch, but Science Schmines is, like, a like a catchphrase sketch. Like, but it's, it's okay if the catchphrase means something. It's okay if the catchphrase means something, Megan. That, so that's the line we're drawing? Is it? Yeah, was, I, was I have a dream a catchphrase to you? Mm -hmm. I was just wondering if you guys are aware that this was a this is like a like a comedy show. Like it's it's a late night comedy show that people are supposed to laugh at. I mean, I laugh at the people who uh, are uh, uh, you know I, I, I arrogant, laugh. arrogant and ignorant of uh, and that might include you at this point, Megan. I laugh. I laugh at people who think differently from me. 
So I just, I don't understand why you guys elevate, and I know you asked me not to talk about this show on the podcast, but like don't, it's don't inevitable it. at this yeah. point. Don't do it. Why you guys elevate this show over something like Saturday Night Live? Is, oh my fucking god. I, I personally think it's great. <sighs> like, okay, I'm trying to hold yeah. back. Like, like, because they've done game shows before as well, but it feels like this game show is very much like it's like the Al Pacino of game shows. Like, it takes itself very seriously versus, you know, I think SNL does a light, a good job of keeping it light and, like, you know, doing a, a game light show that's just, right like... Word. Paper thin is more... Is probably more. Okay, yeah, but it's fun. It's supposed to be... It's television. Like, I don't understand why it has to be also a Mensa test. Look, you know I, what mean, I mean? I mean, Saturday Live, I mean, they might do a game show parody every once in a while or five times a show because maybe they're just trying to find the right concept before something actually latches on. I know they've done, like, Celebrity Jeopardy a few times and, like, oh, so funny. Celebrities are dumb. I mean, celebrity humor. Studio Easy, easy. And, and Studio 60 has moved past that, especially once Matt Albee came on in, in 2006. They've, they've kind of set a bar... That celebrities alone aren't a, can't just be the punchline. You have to you have to aim higher. You have to like work more in. You have to be operating on multiple layers at that point. Would and SNL Saturday Live is not doing that. Would SNL ever try and do a Commedia dell'arte uh, sketch? Uh, I no, hope because not. it's not high minded enough for the viewers of Saturday Night Live. I it's, good God! If I never see a Commedia dell'arte sketch ever again, it would be too soon. Commedia dell'arte. You have to get it. You have to get it, and if you don't get it the first time, maybe you'll see it the second time, and you'll start to get it. Maybe you'll see it the third time, and then you'll really get it. And I think, Megan, you just need to like watch it three or four or five times, and then you might start to kind of appreciate what Matt Albee is going for here. What that sounds for. like I would, I would, like, I don't want to offend you guys, but I would go crazy You're and probably kill myself and everyone around me. That sounds like a nightmare. This is just like this show is so pretentious and heavy-handed. Like it blows my mind that. What's pretentious about Pimp My Trike? Let's talk about Pimp My Trike, okay? Yeah. Pimp My Trike. I like that. Pimp My Trike. Like some people would call it an outdated reference. Some people would do that. Some people would see Massey Oka as a Yakuza member and see, see maybe think it's a little bit racist. But you know what? When it's in service of something, when it's in service of talking about how Israel and Palestine compete against each other and really just bring each other down, mm -hmm. I think that Pimp My Trike can actually do something good for us. The conflict, I feel like, if we want to talk about Israel for a second, which it seems like you do... I am um, raring to go about Israel. I, I think that... I have done all the research on Israel. Like, the conflict between Israel and Palestine is, like, thousands of years old, right? Like, and to take that and be like, you know what, I'm going to write, a, a, okay, fair, it was 12 minutes long, like, that's fine. It was longer Short than they by did. Studio 60 standards. Like, so anyway, 12, they're like, I'm going to take this thousand-year conflict and boil it down to a 12-minute comedy sketch called Pimp My Trike. <laughs> And you're going to take the guy from Heroes, and you're going to put him in the Yakuza, and that's how you're going to deal with it? Well, it I, just seems a little bit, um, I, maybe not the right way to go. I, I thought it was brilliant. I would think that a sketch called Pimp My Trek would be about consumerism and how <laughs> we're marketing towards children and whatnot, but somehow they turned it into a comment on Israel. So they take turns. I'm really they take impressed. turns, and they do twists. They don't... As we were saying, they don't give you what you think you want. They give you what you need. America needs its medicine sometimes. It's very In true. the form of Pimp My Trike. In the form of Masioka in the Yakuza. I'm the starting to, I'm starting to think when it starts the joke, it's not racist, Megan. <laughs> Megan. Megan, I'm starting to think that TGS might be more of your speed if you want to go over I there. I love TGS. I think TGS is fun. TGS. Oh, my God. The I mean, robot is great. I mean, they, they started out that. at the bottom, uh, and then they added Tracy Jordan, and I didn't think that they could dig themselves any deeper. Um, and uh, I, I fear for the day when that show gets canceled, and Tracy is looking for another sketch show, 
uh, hopefully the people at Studio 60 can understand that we don't need uh, the star of Who Dat Ninja in yeah. our in our cast. Sorry, can I can we just check the box office numbers on Who Dat Ninja? Because I'm pretty sure it broke. Okay, um, if A you want to, happened? if you want to just, uh, 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 I'm sure you love the Transformers and uh, uh, and the Avengerses and the Avatarses uh, of this world, but uh, we're looking for some movies that like uh, maybe some of the great movies written by Matt Alby and Danny Tripp. Maybe, maybe uh, Harriet Hayes uh, award-winning performance as Nita Totenberg in the Roman, in the Brian Jones biopic. I mean, uh, they they create films, films, not movies, not films. movies, not popcorn fare. These are the movies that you think about. These are movies that make you feel. They make you uh, uh, want. Uh, you're born again in the movie theater, covered in placental fluids. I think we need to move on. Speaking of born again. Uh, the Nicolas Cage home renovation show, giving re, re, giving new life to old homes, while always that 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 top notch Nicolas Cage impression. Um, mm-hmm. Matt, I know you're a big fan of the Nicolas Cage. He uh, he inhabits him. He uh, embodies this uh, uh, Hollywood uh, celebutant culture, all within Hollywood one. elite. I would say Hollywood elite. Yes. Uh, uh, all within one manic portrayal of uh, a once gifted actor who was very much of the caliber that we were speaking of uh, earlier, but he, his bottom out into the more who dat ninja type fair and basically placing them in different scenarios, each more uh, surprising than the last, be it your cooking shows, be it your marriage counseling shows, and now this time with home re- renovation, I don't know how they would have ever, how they ever come up with these things. Uh, uh, it really showed how the toll that uh, 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 the pressures of Hollywood can put on you. And it was really uh, the symbolics of like, tearing down walls and tearing down uh, your soul. It's tearing down the walls of your soul. Have you guys seen, um, have you guys seen uh, Get in the Cage on SNL? It's Andy Samberg, and he's like, uh, that's how I breathe. I think... I, I don't know what S- I don't use acronyms. I'm not sure what SNL stands oh, for. I'm sorry. Uh, sorry, Saturday Night Live. He just goes like, "That's how I praise," and it's so. It's I mean, fun. I heard really I I saw that some friends were sharing uh, the link over on uh, the YouTube link. I'm more of a Vimeo person, so I wasn't I wasn't really following uh, the what what SNL. Is putting online. I'm following the Studio if, 60 account, but okay. If, if Andrew Sandberg thinks he can hold a candle to Andy, uh, 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 to Alex Dwyer's uh, spot-on portrayal of Nicolas Cage, um, I don't. I, I believe uh, this Andrew Sandberg has moved on to sitcoms now. Uh, the lowest form, in yeah. my view. So. Yeah. Meanwhile, Alex Dwyer continues to do award-winning work uh, uh, on the screen for all of us to see. Maybe I'm just like, I just didn't, as you say, get it. Because, you know, he was wearing that weird, like, tragedy mask the whole time, uh, which I thought was kind of weird. Oh, do we have to explain that to you as well? Rob, you explain this one. Um, So the tragedy mask really just represents how the sadness fuels the actor. And so it, like... It really, they don't commentate on it. They don't bring attention to it because exactly. that would just stop the flow of the comedy. But it's a nice undercurrent and a nice subtext to why Nicolas Cage is always looking for another movie or another TV show because he has an inner emptiness that the tragedy mask, I mean, it's it's his tragedy, is that he doesn't know where he belongs. And I think that uh, Matt Alby has really really done a great job of uh, putting those little bits of, of character development into the sketches, even though the environment changes every single time, as Matt says, kind of amazingly. And also, the prop guys were on strike, so they used the props they had available. Mm-hmm. That's true. Yeah, I guess that's why it looked familiar from, like... I mean, they used it for most of the sketches that I saw. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I, when I, you're dealing with such talented cast... You, be, you don't see it as a mask. You can see it as a spoon. You well, like back when, back when, back when, back in Pin My Trike, when they were having the the Ice T gang and the Yakuza gang representing Israel and Palestine, 
uh, I mean, they did keep saying that uh, he's a Yakuza. He's a Yakuza because he had the tragedy mask on and that was his costume. But, like, it really, I mean... Um, I'm, I'm sure there's some, some, some spicy backstage drama going on around the prop strike right now, and I would love to be a camera that's just kind of going down hallways of Studio 60 right now, seeing how they're dealing with this situation. But, I mean, the way that they're able to still do 90 minutes of amazing comedy, well, 172 minutes this week, as, again, the network let them go long. Um yeah, I, I think that it's great how they were able to work with what they had. Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> All right, well, we, we only have a couple sketches left, and then we can let Megan go back to her simple life. So the Nancy Grace sketch about the uh, SAE Oklahoma uh, racist chant, um, Harriet Hayes, I Harriet mean, Hayes. just... Harriet Hayes. That Nancy Grace... I mean, Nancy Grace has been out of fashion for uh, years and years and years and years, and yet uh, they don't let that hinder a 150% perfect impression. Mm -hmm. um, seeing her take on the racist chant where she was uh, against it, obviously, um, I think it really helped provide some perspective to this controversy. Uh, I mean, I've been waiting for Studio 60's take. Because uh, I don't allow myself to be colored by the media and what they think about uh, various topics and goings-ons and whatnots. But, um, st <laughs> but Studio 60, um, Studio 60, uh, sorry, my girlfriend is watching a cartoon or something, and she's just <laughs> laughing in the background. So um, waiting for Studio 60 to give me the hot take is what I base my entire life around. I'm home oh, wait, every so Saturday. I'm can I just go stop? Ahead, ahead, that, that, okay, that concerns me a little bit. Go ahead. Just pause for one second. I'm just going to say, in my opinion, in real life, if you're going to base your life on that sketch, just a word of warning, like, don't use the N-word that much. But if I'm it's talking about the chant, if I'm quoting the chant, then can't I use the N-word? <laughs> Rob, Whoa, you're, you're white. Whoa. No. <sighs> I mean, I don't know how to provide context of, like, if I say to you they said a chant and it was pretty racist, you don't know what that chant is. But if I tell you the actual chant in words, then I, I think that you tell. know how to, how to you, you have a better idea. I mean, you don't have the studio. Go ahead. Go ahead. I don't, I don't I think, need I think, to hear you do that. I, I really you, don't. Personally, I think you have more of a problem that they brought in Adrian Brody for a cameo for that role. <laughs> I mean, that's problematic, too. My biggest issue was that they made him come back and, you know, do Reprise his character. Yeah, and then all of them just chanted that chant <laughs> on live national television. It just seems like a lot to me. And, I mean, they're white, you know? Harriet's I mean, white. It sounds like, like he might be, so like he might be a little too hard for you. Simon Stiles is not white. He is a proud black man who bootstrapped his way from the streets to Yale drama. And okay, Rob, I'm not stupid. I know he's not white. But Harriet was there, and Adrian Brody was there, and they were white, and they were just dropping end bombs everywhere. And it's like, Harriet dude, Harriet Hayes was embodying that. a character. Hey, Harriet Hayes... Uh, what you're, what this you're is scripted, Megan. Not... I don't know if you know that it's scripted. It's not actually the actors saying the N-word. When you look at your TV screen, you're not seeing Harriet Hayes. You are seeing Nancy Grace. You are seeing Holly Hunter. You are seeing Juliette Lewis. And all of these timely impressions that she is able to do that are more relevant than ever. Because she makes them more relevant than ever. She makes what they're saying the truth. And whatever words come out, it's not her responsibility. It's not her this is the genius work of Matt Alby, and he's trying to make you question your conventions and question what is right and what is wrong about the world. Okay, wait, I mean, you know what doesn't need to be more relevant than ever? The N-word. Doesn't need to be more relevant than ever. I think that needs to be laid well, to rest. Well, maybe you can go White to the American lie. South. You can go to the American South, and you can tell them that uh, uh, apparently we don't need to be told that the N-word is bad because some people down there not using it in the correct way. There is no correct way to use it as a white Quoting person. is the correct way. If I'm quoting somebody using the N-word, 
I can say the N word. To me, the only N word I don't use is News Corp. <laughs> Great. Let's move no, on I'm... to the, let's move on to the final sketch. Final sketch. Uh, a really ter- timely parody of the Jinx. Um, a, a fictional murder procedural thing where um, it ended. Uh, spoiler alert with the twist that the murderer said on on when being interviewed by this interview character interviewer character. Um, he went to the bathroom and he said into a microphone, "I I killed them all. I did it. I murdered it." Um, everybody, and so that has uh, somehow shown up in a lot of news outlets. Um, and so, but anyway, putting all that aside, I thought that this parody where they just have a bunch of people, like uh, say John Boehner, come out and do an interview, and then go into the bathroom and be heard saying that he murdered democracy, that was a real, real, real powerful take. I think. If anybody can can speak to that, yeah, I, I personally was most moved when he had someone come out and say they are a blogger, and then they went into the bathroom and said that, oh, I did it, I murdered uh, relevant journalism, yeah, and and meaningful criticism. I mean, uh, when he, when he had people come out, he had a YouTuber come out, and the YouTuber went into the bathroom and said, I killed a professional, uh, professionally shot, um, professionally edited, professionally written. And uh, planned entertainment. Um, that was that really. I mean, it took. It was a nice blow against YouTubers um, that I don't think have any relevance. Well, yeah. Rob, Rob, you know I'm a. That's what I do for a living, right? Is it now? I thought you were working. I I, I did not know. I thought you you just kind of uh, were bootstrapping your way, uh, trying to get into theater school. Um. No. No. Okay. I, I do work I, I work on YouTube so okay um, this so just how, you know. how how is that going supposed to get you to Juilliard? I'm not I'm I have no real plans on going to Juilliard. What? Not really sure. Just because you can't you can't imagine how you're gonna get there uh, or just like because I I mean I if you believe in yourself I think you can if make you it. if you okay. if you consume more works of Matt Albee. Yeah no I I'm not. I have no plans on going to Juilliard. My biggest concern with you guys again with this sketch is I wanted to let you both know that um, the jinx is a real, like it's true crime. It's a real thing. As happens. in it's it, it's it's true because uh, it it exists in the world as a piece of fiction. No, um, I think Robert Durst is that his name? Robert I Durst. It was Frank Durst. No, that's Limp Bizkit. Uh, okay. not familiar Robert with Durst uh, killed a bunch of people, and um, HBO did a thing about it, and they were parodying that. Um, I don't know what you thought it was, but it was a real. It's it's six episodes, I think, mini series. I'm gonna have to look into this because I don't think that's right. I just mm-hmm. it seems so weird that you haven't heard of it. It's been all over the news. Well, again, yeah, it seems it seems weird that a fiction, a fictional, a finale of a fictional show is is in, in on the news. Well, I think it's a big spoiler. It's a big I, spoiler. I, I I feel it's fitting because bloggers did actually destroy conventional and YouTubers did destroy the uh, the uh, visual arts, and I feel it's fitting <laughs> that it was a parody of something he actually did. YouTubers so. destroyed all visual art. I mean, we okay. all saw we all saw that the museums are shutting down now, and I can probably take that back to YouTube. I think. Yeah, every time Tyler Oakley posts a video, the MoMA sets something on fire. That's exactly what's happening. I think that you're being a little glib right now, but I think that you're you're ignoring the point that we're trying to make, which is that YouTubers are are the worst. It was announced yesterday that Future Shop is closing all of its stores in Canada because no one is buying televisions anymore because everybody's just streaming their things on their phone. On the YouTube. On the YouTube. That's true. That's correct. I think that they said something about that on in the statement that the YouTube uh, uh, closed down Future Shop. Absolutely. Yeah. Rebuttal? Um, well, I I have no real rebuttal. My rebuttal is that <laughs> sure. Fred Durst is of Limp Biscuit. Robert Durst actually killed people. And um, it's a real story. 
and that's what this sketch is. Based I know on. it's a real story because everyone on Twitter was complaining about the spoilers of uh, them saying that he was the killer before the actual last episode okay. aired. And I don't, I don't believe in spoilers. I believe that art exists and it should be consumed, and minor details, a plot, should not ruin an experience for you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. A piece of art can stand on its own. No spoiler should ruin it. I mean, speaking of art, I mean, we can we can bring this to an end. We can talk about uh, uh, Peter Gabriel on the ukulele as uh, the musical guest. It was moving. It I was... mean, yeah. I mean, the first few songs were were really cool, and then like by like song six or seven, I thought he was really getting into his groove. A lesser musical guest would come out and play their hits. They play the songs. He did. He played here. in your eyes on the ukulele six times. I mean, he did different arrangements every time, so can you call it the same song? Yes, you can call it the same song. That's exactly what it was. Um, okay. Well, we'll see, because I'm pretty sure that that EP is going to go straight to the top, and a lot of people are going to disagree with you. Mm-hmm. That it's not... That it, it having uh, one song played multiple times is a waste of time. I don't, think, I don't think you get a standing ovation for playing the same song six times. He did. He got a standing ovation, and I think partially that is because... Every time. Uh, okay. Well, on this, uh, every time he had John Cusack come out with a boombox over his head, which was kind of cool. Like, that's cool. Um, and then everyone immediately sat down when he threw the boombox into the audience and called people corporate chills. And he did it all six times. And yet nobody saw it coming every time it happened. Like, well, every time he did it, he had a new boombox by a different corporate manufacturer. He had a Sony boombox. He had a boombox by one of the other companies uh, the other times. Like, it, it was a different statement every time. Like, you have to, you have to bring attention, because they couldn't just pick one boombox. That's the thing. If they want to be fair and take down all corporations, they have to... Do all seven boombox manufacturers? They use different camera angles each time. It was a tribute to Rashomon. You didn't get that. There are like four people in the hospital because of that joke. For art, I'm pretty sure those were corp. Those were uh, uh, advertising reps. So I'm not worried about them. Mm-hmm. It might have been targeted. John Cusack might have been targeting the, the certain people in the audience. I wouldn't be surprised. I feel like he. He was crying by the fourth time because he knew he'd hurt people, but it was, I guess, in his contract. I, I, I he was crying. The whole, I was crying each performance, so I could barely notice. Well, the article came out today that he had been planning this for months, if not years, and and that's why he didn't do Hot Tub Time Machine two. And I think it was the better choice to be prepping this. Um, it didn't say anything about him caring that he had hurt people. So I think that you're kind of projecting onto Mr. Cusack. Yeah, you're right. John Cusack has, like, a lizard brain. He doesn't care about people. Yeah, I'll believe that. America's sweetheart doesn't care about the people he's hurt with a boombox by throwing it. Yeah, throwing well, it. Well, when, when Joan Cusack came out and she was crying, I think that was that was legitimate sadness. I think she was, the fir- she was the first aid responder on set. I don't know how that happened, but she was, like, bandaging people up, and she was like, John, stop. Like, you could see her lips moving, like, stop, stop. And he was just, like, sobbing, and he was like, I can't, I have to do it. And he threw the boombox and screamed. Well, that's the great thing about Studio 60, is sometimes they make statements like that. They, 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 they make choices like that to make a statement, and even the next day I'm not really sure what that meant, but I'm, I'm happy to, to put in the hours of research to figure it out. Um, every, every episode is like a puzzle box. That's, that's the real joy of Studio 60. You never know. Yeah, yeah. it's constantly surprising me. Should we do trivia? Absolutely. Sure. Studio Absolutely. 60 trivia. I'm All right, so we're gonna, we're gonna, I'm going to ask some questions from, uh, to the two of you, and uh, you guys can give me your answers, and uh, we'll see who knows uh, who, 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 who comes out on top. Um, Matt, uh, first question. Um, who is the longest-running Studio 60 cast member? Of course, it would be uh, Anne Hathaway. Anne Hathaway is correct. That is correct. She she was on the show uh, for 32 seasons. Um, r- long run, uh, ever since she was a child. Uh, really impressive. Um, Megan, who is the highest rated host of Studio 60? Um, I can't remember. I know it was either... Uh, Millie or Vanilli, but I think I know one of them committed suicide, and then the other one came and hosted. I th- and it was I whoever thought... hosted. Can I steal? Um, yes, Matt can steal. Uh, ben Bernanke. 
That is true. But Millie and Vanilli both tied for second place. Um, okay. They they were a few hundred thousand uh, viewers short. Um, but yeah, uh, uh, Matt got that point too. Going back to Matt, um, Matt, how many times has uh, Studio 60 beaten SNL in the ratings total? Ooh. Every year since Matt Albee and Danny Tripp came back into the fold. I'm going to need that in the form of a number. Uh, 317. That is correct. Thank you. Yes. Um, uh, Megan, uh, do you uh, want to try and uh, tell us um, what is uh, the shortest uh, monologue ever recorded uh, uh, on the Studio 60 stage? Oh, my God. I mean, they all have felt long to me. All of them. Mm, by design. I've never yeah. seen a monologue on that show and felt that that was the appropriate amount of time for that person to be talking uh, in any at any time. Like in life, like on television, like in front of a camera, behind a camera. Like it just has... The question was not how would you get out. So yet Megan, I'm, I'm getting kind of sick of your attitude at this point. I think that you really... Your bias is showing that uh, the only sketch you like is Peripheral Vision Man. You keep uh. looking up SNL. I, Megan, I think that it's time that you actually just uh, admit that you are not a Studio 60 fan and that you, uh, you're just claiming to be a Studio 60 fan. I'm not even claiming to be a Studio 60 fan. I did this as a favor to you, Rob, because you couldn't find anyone else to do this podcast today. I couldn't find anybody who who un, who understood uh, how a great Studio 60 is, and I thought that you would be the exception. And I'm I'm really disappointed to find out that I was wrong in one of my rare that's, instances when I'm wrong. Yeah, I that's, explicitly that's, told you I don't really like this show, but if you can't find anyone else, I'll do it. And then you texted me at two in the morning yesterday, panicking on cocaine. I don't know, being like, "Look, we need someone for this podcast." I'm like freaking out right now. Like, well, I don't think my dead grandma would be happy about this. And I was like, "That's heavy stuff. Well, like, maybe not that serious. Fine. Like, I'll do it." I, I didn't really want to do it. I'm sorry your grandma passed away, but I feel like she wouldn't care, man. It's a podcast. Megan, I've been really disappointed in how you have treated this like your own little advertisement for Saturday Night Live and other candy-coated little shows that aren't willing to go to the edge anymore. I don't think that you appreciate the opportunity that you've had today, and I, I, I wish that you would please just uh, 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 shut up for a second and appreciate that uh, you have a forum here to uh, talk about one of the best shows in the world. So, okay. Matt, do you want to jump in here? Yeah, I want to say one thing. Well, that's swell, Megan. But our other guest is standing in the middle of Australia. That's why he couldn't be on, Megan. He's in Australia fighting a war. I, I don't think Brian is fighting a war. I think he's just there because, like, on vacation. But like, he's on you know his own what? personal war. He's on a war of discovery. He's on a Clearly, war against cubicles, against having to live your life day in and day out in an office, restrained in your creativity. Okay, you know what? I'm gonna let you guys have this one because clearly, you little nerds, it's very important to you. So let's just finish this up. I want to thank my guests for being here today. Um, I want to thank uh, Matthew Smith, most of all. Uh, thank thank you, Robert. It's a pleasure, as always. <laughs> so, somewhat less than usual this time, but mm -hmm. you're a gentleman, as always. Uh, and Megan, I know that this happens every week, but uh, uh, thank you for coming on again, even if we might not, if we might disagree. I'm not coming on next week, man. Don't ask me. Well, well, you said that last week, and we'll see what happens next week. So, all right. Um, thank you, everybody, uh, and uh, we'll be back next week for uh, for your hosts, um, Kobe Smulders. Thank you. Bye.